Well, good morning, everybody. Fall came all of a sudden. Um, well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I was in San Diego this last week helping my mother in law do a bunch of work on her house. It's a long story, but good to be home. I came home and it's much cooler. It's hot and humid out there, so it's good to be good to be back. But um, before we get going, I'll take care of the dirty work right off the bat. We are in need of some volunteers. Tomorrow we are starting the basement, and we have 115 kids signed up. Wow. So it's going to be great. And kind of to kick off the year, we did this last year too. Oh, actually, no, that's not true because we started the basement in January. But when we did start the second semester uh, for the kids, we started the basement off by just giving pizza away, and it was awesome. Um, so we just need somebody to pass out pizza. That's it. Very easy. Actually, two people. So if anybody would like to do that and could help, we really, 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 really could use your help and would love it. Um, come talk to me afterwards. I'll get you guys uh, set up. Uh, it's at, um, I think, at 1120 is when the first crew comes in. So something like that. So yeah, so probably be here about 11-ish. Don't quote me on that. I'll get you the details later. But uh, we really uh, could use your help. So anyways, come talk to me later. It's going to be awesome. 115 kids. It's going to be great. Yes. I think. I think they don't do it Fridays, so I think they do it on Monday through Thursday. So. Well, what are they signed up for? The basement. It's oh, so okay. So to clarify, what the basement is, it's a place for the kids to come over from school during lunchtime and have just sort of a a cool, safe space for them to eat lunch and hang out. So they get down there, they do foosball and air hockey and whatever else. It's not necessarily a structured time. It's just a, a, an opportunity for them to come and hang out here, get to know us. But it is sort of a, a fishing hole for kids to sign up for Alpha. Uh, and if you don't know what Alpha is, that's a small group uh, Bible study that really helps people start at a really high level kind of philosophical question, you know, like, hey, what's wrong with the world? And you ever thought about maybe there's a God out there and things like that? And then you work your way down to the fact that we all need Jesus. So Alpha is a really cool program to do that. Um, so I'll, almost every person that did Alpha in the Youth Alpha last year came from the basement. So it's a huge outreach opportunity for us. So, but, but it's more or less just sort of a, a time for them to hang out, play during lunchtime. So that's what that is. So anyways, come talk to me later. Um, glad you guys are here. Love you guys. Uh, we have part two of Dr. Scott Winnig. It's going to be a blast. And then next week we'll have Tom Melton uh, to do some uh, interesting topics so that'll be fun he's also doing the man meal so if you haven't signed up for the man meal men make sure you sign up that's this friday and that's it cool let's uh let's pray here and we can start god we are so grateful for you we are grateful that you have delivered us god from uh being a slave to sin a slave to the world and a slave to ourselves um god we are grateful that you have found us that you've delivered us that you've brought us out of darkness and into light um, help us as we reflect today, as we learn today, on how that will affect our relationships, how that affects uh, the way that we form others in our relationships with others, and how we too will be formed and the environment we choose to put ourselves in to be formed. Um, God, just help us to learn a lot today, open our minds, open our hearts, and help us not only to, to learn today, but to take this and put this into practice in whatever we, and then in whatever we do. Uh, be with the church as we encounter and um, help uh, or help the kids to encounter you uh, through the basement and through Alpha and so on. Uh, we know school just started last week. Uh, please be with the teachers and principals and all the administrators and so on as well. And we pray that we can be a great light on the hill here uh, next to Bear Creek High School and Bear Creek K-8 and the surrounding community here in Lakewood, God. Uh, we love you. We need you dearly. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen. Cool. With no further ado, Dr. Scott Winnick. Thanks, Chuck. Hey, so good to see all of you. I hope you ha had a really, really good week. Uh, just a little uh, hands in the air to start this morning. How many of you were here in the no hour back in July on the 10th or the 17th or the 24th? Any of those three Sundays? Uh, my colleague Dave Bushard was speaking. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, what Dave did was this. He did three weeks 
on Christ and culture, integrating our faith into the public square. So Dave did three weeks on that, and if you get to know my friend and colleague Dave, he is meticulous and detailed to the nth degree. And that's what makes him a really good theologian. That's what you want in theologians. <clears throat> Let me ask you this. As you reflect a little bit on those three weeks that he did, what were some of your takeaways? What questions or concerns might you have with this topic of Christ and culture? <laughs> well, that's, that, that's OK. You're incredibly bright, Wayne. So you know, we're, yeah, we're going to take you to the front of the class. Oh, I don't remember anything. OK. <laughs> well, I wish Christ were in culture. OK. He certainly is not. You mean right now in American culture? Yes. OK. Let, let me just reflect back. What's your name? Steve. Steve? Let me reflect back, Steve. Do you think that Christ is in this church today? Absolutely. Amen. Amen. Is this church in the community of Greater Lakewood? Yes. Uh, we have a great, great, great ministry to Bear Creek High School. Is Christ somewhere in American culture today? He is somewhere. Somewhere. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to talk about that. Good. I appreciate your honesty. Yes, please. Yeah. All the way from. Yes. Yeah. Right. Oh, good. That's great. Well, I'm going to come back briefly and hit on that. But yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Is it Roy? <coughs> Roy, yeah. I think uh, Christ has had a big They're saying God exists, he's transcendent, we, we like his presence with us, at least during this meeting. Yeah, Wayne, please. Thanks, Roy. I'm starting to remember the tension that on uh, this continuum, or actually not his, but world, uh, that on the one side you have rigidity, you know, that, that we reject uh, popular culture, uh, and on the other side, complete engagement. Yeah. And as you move toward the engagement, it gets messy. Oh. I'm taking lots of risks, and, and I, uh, back then I thought of like, Jesus letting the two women uh, anoint his feet, and how he was really out there with the risk in, in uh, both of the counterculture uh, and, and uh, bringing his spirit, his influence uh, to, to the culture by allowing this. Uh, so that's an example that we want to avoid tension and avoid awkward situations or, or making mistakes. Uh, we won't follow Jesus. That's a great insight. Yeah, I appreciate that. Wow, good. Somebody else. Yeah, please. I think um, one of the questions I kind of that was floating around my head from all that uh, discussion was, you know, we do have kind of shifts and changes that happen in culture, and as a result of that, I think as Christians, we 
are kind of required to be responsive, but it then lends itself to this question of like, how do we love people who receive love in different ways? Yeah. You know, it's like, good, okay, good we point. kind of have a model of that in Christianity. But when you go out into the world, they're like, yeah, what you're trying to do or the value systems you're trying uh, to, to, to adhere to in loving us is not one I consider that. And we see that tension increasingly growing, growing I think, in our culture today. So it makes for a, a, a difficult conversation about our own formation, I think, that kind of goes in that same way. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, one of our doctor of ministry students has a great, great ministry on college campuses, and right now he's at Penn State. And uh, one of the things that he's noticing as, and this has been a new ministry for him and his family in the last year, is, and he, he said this in a DMIN class that I was in with him about a month ago, he said, well, one of the things I've realized is that the progressive movement, which most of us on this side of the political equation don't agree with in terms of tactics and strategy, but he said, one of the things I've come to realize is they want a better world. They want justice, and they want equality, and they want to minimize human pain and suffering. And he said, who amongst us as a Christian don't agree with those long-term goals? Now, the tactics or the strategy of how they want to get there, we might disagree with. But what they're doing is they're engaging culture and saying, we need to change this because it's unjust and unfair and inequitable and, you know, et cetera. But I think you're making a great point. Now, let, let me share with you what I'd like to do today. I want to talk about two things today related to our Christian formation surrounding this huge, huge, never, never ending issue of Christ and culture. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pass out a sheet here in a moment and I'm going to do what I call little brief theology of culture. In other words, I want us to think about the whole issue of culture from a theological perspective. That's the first thing I'm going to do. So I'm going to walk us through the sheet. Everybody will have a sheet. We'll just walk through that. But then the second thing I want to do is I want to take a look from one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible about what is proper and improper enculturation. And then how do we disenculturate, at certain points at least, in order to enhance and promote our Christian formation? How do we do that? And so I want to go to a biblical example of someone who did that exceptionally well. So to get us started, let's do some thinking about culture and a theology of culture. If you pass a couple back there to your friends, and if you can just like to pass those around there, get one of you like one to pass the shot here. I think there's plenty. some thoughts on culture and developing a theology of culture. This topic is unbelievably crucial. Uh, Dr. Bushart talked about H. Richard Niebuhr's classic work, Christ and Culture, and in the beginning of that book, and, and let me make this, this comment, um, I read that book my first year in seminary, and um, it's a horribly written book. It's terribly written. It was the most important book I read in four years when I was at Denver Seminary. It's completely shaped the way I think about Christianity and what Jesus is trying to do in our culture and in the world today. I, it's a horribly written book, and I, I keep telling my friends, somebody really smart like Chuck Hess, ought to go back and rewrite that and put it in plain English. But it's an incredibly important book because Niebuhr says this is the enduring problem. He was a church historian. I'm a church historian, so I resonate there. And he knows church history really well. And he says, the two most important factors in any Christian's life are Jesus of Nazareth and the culture that that particular Christian lives in. Those are the two forces that are always tugging at us. So he called it the enduring problem. And then what he did was, and Dave unpacked this, so I'll just do a little review. 
Niebuhr came up with five responses or five types of a Christian's response, a Christian's response to culture. One was Christ against culture. One was Christ of culture. One was Christ above the culture. One was Christ in paradox with the culture. And one was Christ the transformer of culture. Now, whenever we talk about this with our students, because they're young and idealistic, and I love that about them, and I want to encourage that in them, not, not squander that or squash that. Everybody says, well, I'm going to be a Christ of transformer culture person. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's great. I want you to do that, too. That's more challenging than we think. Yeah, so th those are the five types. And as I put here, culture is almost always as influential on the church as Christ is. Sometimes it's more influential. In other words, culture is this incredibly powerful force that influences our Christianity. It influences the way we see life, do life. It influences the way we do church. Over time, and this is one of the big lessons of church history, over time, the church will always begin to reflect the culture that it's a part of. It always does that. So, for example, uh, you all know your New Testaments really well, and you know that Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13 go up there into Asia Minor and they're preaching the gospel in Iconium and Pisidian Antioch and Lystra and Derby and they go in and preach the gospel and they win people to Christ and they set up these little churches, these little ecclesias. And then they go back up there later on and revisit them and they appoint elders and deacons in those churches. In other words, they have to institutionalize them. So then eventually towards the end of his ministry, Paul appoints Timothy, who's the bishop in Ephesus, to make sure that all the churches in Ephesus and the surrounding area are functioning according to how he wants them done. And he says the same thing to Titus in Crete. Well, Paul's martyred probably 66, 67 AD in the Aronian persecution. Timothy and Titus, we think Timothy was martyred about 10 years later in, in Ephesus. We're not sure what happened to Titus. But here's what's really, really interesting. By the end of the first century, in the Roman Empire and even to the east in the Persian Empire, which the church got to as well, you have the beginnings of what we call an Episcopal church structure, where you have a bishop over a wide variety, a wide geographical area with all these different churches in them. And each of those churches has a priest or a pastor with some deacons. And you have a bishop over all of these churches in these areas, we call those dioceses. And so I always try to point out in church history, one of the things you have to realize is very early on, within the first hundred years, the church takes on what we call an Episcopal polity, an Episcopal structure, with bishops and, and pastors and deacons and deaconesses. The reason it did that is because it was adapting to the political culture, the political culture of the Roman Empire, which had Roman governors and proconsuls and mayors. In other words, the church adopted its structure to the culture that it was a part of. And nobody seemed to think too much about it. In fact, Episcopal structure continued on for centuries. And it wasn't until the Reformation in the 16th century that those of us who call ourselves Protestants went back and revisited the whole issue of church structure. So my point is the church always over time reflects the culture it's part of, whether it's American culture, Argentinian, Argentinian culture, African culture, it always does. Now, let me give us some definitions here. There was a group called the Willowbrook Group just about 25 years ago. They spent thousands and thousands of dollars trying to study and analyze culture, and here's the definition they came up with, the pattern ways in which people relate to each other. <laughs> one of my favorite theologians, one of my intellectual mentors, he was a missionary to India for 40 years, the, the British missiologist, and churchman Leslie Newbigin says this, culture is the sum total of ways of living developed by a group of human beings and handed on from generation to generation. This is my definition. I'm a little bit simplistic here. The way people do life. That's culture. Now, here are some general propositions. If culture is an enemy of the gospel, then the only logical response for Christians is to separate out from the culture. Eugene Peterson, famous writer, pastor, said this clear back in 1997, 25 years ago, this culture is evil, meaning American culture. Well, if Eugene was right, every Christian in North America should have just disengaged from the culture, said we're going to have nothing to do with it because it's evil. 
eh, he'd probably go, well, Scott, that's not exactly what I meant. But that's kind of the logical response to that. On the other hand, if culture is a friend or at least neutral to the gospel, then contextualization, it's a big word, is the answer. Here's Newbigin's definition of contextualization. The value of the word contextualization is that it suggests the placing of the gospel in the context of a culture at a particular moment, a moment that's shaped by the past and looks to the future. So that's pretty abstract. Let me try to make it concrete. The bridge at Bear Creek has a culture. We do church here a certain way. Now, last week I shared I have the privilege of preaching around town throughout the course of the year, especially in the summer. So, and over the last 12 years, 13 years since Melanie and I have been married and I transitioned out of leading the church that I was pastoring at the time, we've been in a lot of different churches and it's really, really great. We love going to different churches to see what they do. Churches do church very differently depending on where you go, even though they're all Protestant. So we have a particular culture here at the Bridge of Bear Creek. So, you know this when you go to worship. We're gonna go in and Nate's gonna get up and he's gonna give the welcome and the announcements. And that guy's amazing. He can give 100 announcements in about two minutes. I mean, he, he is just, his, his, I'm thinking, they should hook his brain up and let him run American civilization, okay? I mean, the guy's amazing, you know, and he talks really fast and he gets it done and then Ian comes up and leads us in some singing. And then sometimes we'll have a testimony or something and then James will come up or who's ever preaching that day, like Nate preached last week, and they'll preach. And then after that, we'll, we'll do the Lord's Supper and then we sing a couple more songs. And then Ian almost always says the same thing. We're going to do the benediction, and then we're going to yeah. get out of here. Yeah. In other words, what's happened at the Bridge at Bear Creek over the last four years is since the merger, they've created a culture the way we do church here. If you like the culture of this church, you stay in this church. You're thinking, I love my church. I love the Bridge at Bear Creek. But if you don't, you go somewhere else. Now, I happen to have some really good friends who are pastors of Anglican churches. There are grads who are doing a great job. When you go to their church, and they're both really good leaders and excellent preachers, both of them. They're both excellent preachers, but you're, you only preach 25 minutes there. James is just getting warmed up at that point, okay? Yeah, you know that, so do I. He's just getting warmed up at 25, you know. Well, in their church, you only preach 25 because they give a tremendous amount of attention to the Lord's Supper and everybody, including children, come forward to take the Lord's Supper. Now, <clears throat> true confessions, let me lay my cards on the table. I'm a Baptist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what the difference is between a Baptist and a terrorist. Yeah, you can negotiate with the terrorist. <laughs> so I'm a Baptist. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm a Presbyterian wannabe. I, 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 culturally, I'm a Presbyterian, but theologically, ecclesiastically, I'm a Baptist. But when we went to Wellspring and we went to um, Trinity Anglican, I loved it because we were sitting up front and the whole family's come up to take communion, and it, it's pretty emotional. I mean, I really like it. My point is this the way we do church is contextualized. We put it in a particular time, a particular place, and we say, this is how we're going to contextualize the gospel in this location. So, the Bridge of Bear Creek is contextualized. Now, a theology of culture. I talked about this a little bit last week in talking about relationships. There is a culture to the Blessed Trinity. The persons of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relate to each other in a pattern way. But this is a culture without sin. And remember what I said last week, this is so important for us as Christians, it's so important for me as a Christian. At the center of the Trinity is perfect harmony, perfect peace, and nothing but utter love. In other words, the center of the universe is love. And that's why Jesus said, love God, love other people, because he wants us to be people of love. Now, according to the image of God, the Imago Dei, which we talked about a bit last week, God has created you and me and all of us as cultural beings. And you see that in Genesis chapter 2. Adam and God were communing together in, in the cool of the day. And Adam was naming the animals, and Adam was doing this, and then eventually God makes Eve. And that was a culture without sin as well. But as we talked about last week, and once again, I just want to reiterate this, what happened in Genesis 3 was Adam and Eve fall and it's utter catastrophe. And this takes us into the level of total depravity. Now, 
once again, as I said, total depravity, friends, does not mean that you and I are as bad as we can possibly be. It does mean that every single part of our lives and our persons, our minds, our wills, our emotions, our bodies, they're all tainted by sin. Our families are tainted by sin. Our churches are tainted by sin. Our schools are tainted by sin. Our culture at large is tainted by sin. Civilizations are tainted by sin. The world is tainted by sin. Doesn't mean it's as bad as it can possibly be. It does mean that it's fallen and that it's broken. So, we're fallen in all aspects of our being, therefore culture's fallen too. And you see that in Genesis 3 on into Genesis 4. In Genesis 4, culture starts to develop out. The author's telling us about that. Humanity's starting to make tools, they're starting to develop music, but there's also murder that takes place there. So, it's, it's fallen. Now, while both humanity and culture are severely marred by sin, this is the hope. Neither is beyond redemption. Humanity's not beyond redemption. Culture's not beyond redemption. That's the hope of the gospel. Now, let me skip that F part because that's a little bit confusing and turn to the backside and talk about the role of the prophet. Now, over the course of the time I've been a Christian, there have been different people who have arisen up who wanted to play prophet to the culture. Yeah, sometimes that's okay. Most of the times it's not. And here's, here's why it's not. Prophets were always always supernaturally appointed, not self-appointed. In other words, when you look at the prophets of the Old Testament, or you look at the prophets in the New Testament, they're always appointed by God. Most of them did not want to be prophets. Jonah's the classic example of that, but Amos doesn't want to be a prophet. You read the book of Jeremiah, he has this ongoing dialogue where he is mad at God most of the time because God made him really suffer to preach to the fallen, broken people of Judah. They didn't want to be prophets. They were supernaturally appointed. And you even see that in the New Testament. So the, the thing is here, it's, I'm always leery when somebody says, well, I want to speak prophetically to the church. I'm thinking, oh, okay, but did God tell you to do that? Or are you just appointing yourself? You've got to be careful about that. So I, I say this. Therefore, while we must always cast a critical eye on the present evil age, and it is, we need to be wary of speaking true pro too prophetically, lest we find ourselves simply speaking against cultural mores rather than genuinely sinful patterns of behavior. I thought Dwayne made a great point about what Jesus did. Jesus pressed the envelope culturally. He lived in a very restrictive Jewish environment, and yet he was always pressing against that in order to extend the love of God and his redemptive grace. So, let me give you an example here that I have discussions with, and I've had discussions with over the years with friends of mine at Denver Center. About 40 years ago, there were some pretty great leaders in the United States who figured out the church was not reaching baby boomers. So, what they did was they did surveys in Southern California, Chicago, and here's what they found out. They went, to, they went house to house to house to house. And they found out, hey, why, if, are you going to church? Yeah, great, glad you're going to church, going to the next house. Are you going to church? No, why not? Well, all they ever talk about is money. It's really boring, and we just can't relate. So what they did was they created new forms of church. And the new forms of church look like this. They brought in bands who did kind of rock music worship. And then they would have dramatic skits on themes related to the topic of the sermon. And then what the pastors would do is they would preach thematically on these topics. Yeah, in other words, they were trying to contextualize the gospel to reach lost people. That was their goal. And they were very, very, very successful about that. Well, as time went on over the last 40 years, that evolved, the new generation came up. And so now you have some churches, not all churches, but some churches, we don't do this here, but in some churches they have smoke machines and lights and they have a band that it, it's a rock concert. I just preached in one of these churches about six weeks ago. And I loved it, loved their church. They're doing a great job. The pastor's a friend in one of our D-Men programs. But I'm sitting in the front row, and they have smoke machines, and they have lights, and, you know, uh, I mean, I'm going, wow, this is cool. Now, here's the thing. They're not trying to target me. They're trying to target the 25-year-old who lives down in Highlands Ranch, or what's the... How's Sterling Ranch, that's who they're trying to target, and they're reaching them. 
In other words, they're shifting the way they're doing church to contextualize it to the culture. In other words, they're pressing the cultural envelope a little bit in order to reach lost people. And I, I really respect that. Now, in the New Testament, according to John's Gospel, Jesus became part of culture in the incarnation. In other words, he engaged in certain patterns of relating to other people. John 1.1, 1, 1, you all know this. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then if you fast forward down to verse 14, John says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And the word that he uses there for dwelt is he tabernacle. And what John's doing is he's referencing back to the Old Testament when Yahweh, with the people of Israel, traveled with them through the Shekinah glory. He tabernacled with them. And what John's trying to show is Jesus is Yahweh incarnate in the flesh now. So the incarnation is where God connects to the culture, but in Jesus' case, without sin. Like I said last week, Jesus related all kinds of different people in all kinds of different contexts, always without sin. Always without sin. And you could translate, you could translate John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You could translate that, God so loved the culture. Now, in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, Paul's talking about his ministry, and he's talking about to the Jews, I became a Jew, to the Greeks, I became a Greek, to those without the law, I, I became without the law, though I abide by the law of Christ. I do all things with all people in order that I might win some. In other words, he's very engaged in culture in his ministry. And the reason why is this, and this is really, really, really what I want us to get. There's always hope in Jesus and the gospel. Always hope. Always hope. And that's why, friends, you and me in our Christian lives and in our churches, we always want to be opportunity-driven. Don't operate out of guilt. Guilt is a terrible motivator. Yeah. You know this, because this is happening. Whether it's James or somebody else who's preaching at some other church you were at, pastoral preach a really challenging sermon and maybe you didn't feel like you're living up to that and so you're feeling kind of guilty kind of convicted and you you kind of like that in some ways but other ways you don't you walk to the car and then you get in the car and you're going home to lunch and half hour later guilt's gone you've forgotten all about your conviction guilt is not a good long-term motivator it doesn't work very well what works well is opportunity where's my opportunity to grow spiritually where's my opportunity to be formed as a christian where's my opportunity to advance the gospel. And I love this quote by Karl Barth, probably the greatest theologian of the 20th century. We, that is the church, we're the provisional representatives of the new humanity. In other words, someday when Jesus returns, the redeemed will be completely visible. The new humanity, well, according to Paul, in Ephesians, we're the, we're the provisional representatives of that as the church. So that's, to me, that's incredibly hopeful. Now, that raises this question, what do these general themes mean for us as we engage the various cultures of the world in general, and American culture in particular in the 21st century? And then I want to talk about a possible model of cultural engagement. <clears throat> One thing, you know this, and I know this because we're all experiencing this, and I think we need to just get a grip on this as Christians. We're now living in a world at large, and a culture in particular, that is in very rapid change. At the macro level of both the world and our culture, things are changing very rapidly. This has happened before. When you look at the late 15th century on into the 16th century in Europe, it was a period of very rapid change and development. I mean, the printing press was invented, which completely changed the dissemination of information. That was the 16th century, the 15th century when Gutenberg invented it. But it was equivalent to us encountering the internet. Um, the, the religious system of Europe was broken, and eventually you would have reformers like Luther and Calvin and Zwingli come up and reconfigure theology, salvation, and the church the discovery of the new world in the late 15th century changed everything. 
it, it's hard for us to imagine. Pe people in the Middle Ages didn't think the Earth was flat. They knew the Earth was a sphere. They just thought it was much, much smaller than it was. So when Columbus and his crew set off, they think they're going to go to India. That was their goal. We're going to go to India. We're going to load up on spices. We're going to return. We're going to I'll be rich. Well, they get out there into the middle of the Atlantic, and they keep going and going, and there's no land in sight. And finally, Columbus makes a really hard leadership decision. He realizes in the next day or so, we've got enough supplies that if we turn back, we can make it back to Spain, OK? But if we don't, and, and we run out, we're all going to die out there in the ocean. But he, he rolls the dice and keeps going. And eventually, they make it to these islands in the Caribbean, and they think it's India, and so they call the natives Indians. Well, it's not. It's a new world. And eventually, eventually Columbus figures it out. And then he goes back a couple more times, and they figure out they discovered a new world with huge land masses. And then Magellan eventually does his circumnavigation of the globe. It takes three and a half years. He dies on the way. In other words, it changed their reality. I always try to tell students this. It'd be as if for us today, if Vulcans landed on Earth and realize all of a sudden, oh, there are other creatures out there in the universe. That would, that would shake your world up a little bit. My point is this. You and I are living in a time of very rapid and massive change. Yeah, I have a subscription to Barron's Magazine. I read it every Saturday because I'm kind of a financial. That's kind of my hobby on the site. And they were, uh, they were they had this interview yesterday that I was sharing with this guy and he's a Basically, what he is is he's, he's trying to forecast trends into the future. Nobody can predict the future. But he's looking at current trends to figure out for their investment firm, what are the best investments for their clients to make money. And I was telling Melanie this last night at dinner. This, this guy is probably in his early 40s. You can tell he's really, really smart, really well educated. And he said this. He goes, listen, <laughs> he's telling the interview. He says, millennials are now. Are you a millennial? Technically. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's basically saying your generation is nothing. Because, because Gen Z, people born from 96 to 2016, he says they're everything. There's a huge number of them, huge number, huge number. And the way they're doing life, and these are some of your grandchildren probably, is completely different than the way I do life. Like he says, they're not going to drive. They don't want to drive. They don't want to get driver's licenses. And here's why. Well, part of it is, yeah, they are the minimalist. Part of it is they want to go green, so they want to call Uber rather than own a car. But, but he said this. He goes, they live on their phones, and if you drive, you have to disconnect yourself from your phone. They don't want to do that. But if you call an Uber, you call your Uber, and he goes up, and he's still, you know, you can still be on your phone, talking to your friends, and texting, and whatever else. And he said, Gen Z is going to change everything. We're the Uber drivers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's no money in retirement, so yeah. there you yeah. go. Yeah, well, I, I have a friend who's 77 years old. He just bought a Tesla. He's an Uber driver. Yeah, well, yeah. he sends me an email a week ago with a picture of his Tesla. He said, Scott, here's my Tesla. It's fantastic. He had two of his grandkids with him. He goes, I want to have lunch. I want to give you a ride in my car, and I won't even charge you. you know? yeah. My point being, we're living in time of very rapid change. And that's not always easy to engage. Now, let me stop there for a minute. Questions, comments, concerns about what we're talking about here in terms of Christianity, culture, and our spiritual formation. Yes? Oh, there you go. Yes. We want to Christianize. Yes. And then, so that was a dilemma we had in terms of, we had to rethink everything in terms of is it right or wrong or stupid. Yes. God bless you. Yeah, you're trying to be sensitive to the culture that you have engaged. And they speak a different language, they do life differently, they see things differently. But you want to put the gospel in a culturally contextualized way so they can at least hear it. Great. Yes, please go. We did some translation, or I did some translation work when I was over there. Uh, they didn't have the Old Testament, and most of them were being you know, translated. So I uh, thought Isaiah, part of Isaiah 1, uh, where it says, Though your sins be a scarlet, and it's quite snowy. Yeah. Uh, they, they have never seen snow, so to tell them that, 
doesn't make sense to me. Yes. So what I had to do was find a cultural equivalent. Yes. The word snow. So I used the word bonus, which is the meat inside the cup. Pure. Oh, that's great. See, that, that's what I call proper enculturation. Yeah, you're just being sensitive. I got condemned. I'm sorry about that because I like what you did, but that's just my opinion. Sir. So, I guess a question, comment, concern, whatever is Christian culture when it butts up against the rest of American culture. Uh, what what are the problems, what are the concerns when it's simply Christian culture? You know, like, what is this, 1953, having a form of godliness but denying its power? Yeah. So the culture of Christianity without actual, like, power of Jesus and that whole dynamic. And I guess that's something that I, I think about, but I don't know how to really do anything with that or how to help with that. No, other than doing no ours, but... <laughs> well, you're raising a really significant and, in my opinion, very challenging issue that you and I need to have lunch over, and then maybe between the two of us, you can help me unpack your, your issue, okay? okay? Yeah, I'd like to do that, okay? That's really complex. So let, 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 let me talk about, for our, our purposes here, Christian formation. Because that's what you're about, that's what I'm about, that's what the Bridge Church at Bear Creek's about. I want to take us to one of my favorite passages in the entire scripture, Daniel chapter 1. And in this chapter, I think we see three things. We see enculturation of believers, and then we see disenculturation of believers because they came, Daniel and his three friends, came to the conclusion that to go this step would would basically corrupt them and then what God's trying to do in this whole issue of culture and believers so let's let's look at this narrative together and like I said I love this narrative it says in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim king of Judah Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it now if you read the book of 2nd Kings and you get to chapters 24 and 25 it talks about the history of this and the reason this happened, and, and I'll get to this here in a second, is because the people of Judah were corrupt, and they wouldn't listen to the prophets like Habakkuk and Jeremiah. They, and God kept telling them, you've got to repent, you've got to repent, you've got to repent. They wouldn't, so he finally decides he's going to destroy them and carry them off to, into exile. And here's the deal, verse 2. And the Lord, the Lord, meaning the sovereign Lord Yahweh, delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God, these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put them in the treasure house of his God. So that sets the stage. Judah's corrupt spiritually. They've been warned. They won't repent. So God raises up Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylonians. He comes to Judah. He surrounds Jerusalem. And he carries off these exiles back to Babylonia along with some of the articles from the temple. The author wants you and me to know God is behind this. And let me quote Beth Moore here, who I respect a lot. When she was teaching on this text, she stopped right here and she looked the 500 women in her audience in the eye and she said this. You know, she's got the hair going and you know, the fingernails. And she's great. She's a great communicator. She says, we need to take God seriously. Let us take God seriously. This is serious business. And she's right. We want to take God seriously. I need to. You need to. That's part of our Christian formation. Now, Let's look at enculturation. Look what happens to these exiles, verses 3 through 7. Then the king, that's Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, one of his right hand people, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Now, friends, what I want us to notice here is that these young men are being reinculturated. They've been uprooted from this culture, transported as exiles 600 miles away across the desert to this 
up and coming civilization that's very advanced, very hierarchical, very sophisticated. And they are being enculturated into this civilization. They have to eat the king's food, drink the king's wine. They have to go to the king's school. They have to learn the king's math. They have to read the king's literature. They have to wear the king's clothes. And then look at what happens in verses 6 and 7. This is really interesting. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now listen, listen, listen. This is really important. The chief official gave new names to them. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. They're renamed with names of Babylonian gods. They're being completely reinculturated because Nebuchadnezzar is trying to train them up to go into his service for the good of his empire. So he's retraining them educationally, he's retraining them linguistically, he's retraining them scientifically, and he's even retraining them in terms of giving them new names because they're going to be his servants in his court, in his civilization. They are being re-enculturated. Now, let me use an example here for you and me. I like USA Today music. I used to have a subscription to it. I don't if I could afford it, I would. Okay. Well, the, one of the reasons I like USA Today is because it's always broken out into four elements. It has a blue element, and that's the front page. And basically, what the blue element represents, more or less, I'm generalizing, is the political context of the United States and the world. It's about politics, pretty much. And then they do a green element, and that's money. Now, I like money. You like money. We all like money. Money's a big part of life. It's a big part of your life. Big part of my life. You gotta have money to live, especially in 10% inflation. Now, money's important, and so they talk about money and they talk about mutual funds and ETFs, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you know, how to fight inflation, so that, that's good. And then they have sports, the red. Now, I love sports. I've been playing sports since I was six years old. I, Melanie will attest to this. My favorite month of the year is March, because that's when March Madness is going. I think March Madness is the greatest sport in the, in the history of the universe, because the kids lay it on the court, it's sudden death, you finally get to the championship game. It's just amazing. You know, kids who lose their crying, and I like to see them cry because you know what? Their hearts are broken. They left it all on the court. I love that. I, I'm a huge NFL fan. I'm excited about the Broncos yeah. this year. Very excited. I love sports. Sports are a big, big deal in American culture. And the last but not least, they have the purple, purple section that they call life, and it's basically about entertainment. About entertainment. And the reason I like this, as you can see, this is a huge element of American culture. This is a huge element of American culture. This is a huge element of American culture. And this is a huge element of American culture. In other words, you read USA Today, you're figuring out, here's what it looks like to be enculturated as an American. OK, great. Now, let's go back to the text. Verse 8. But Daniel, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Friends, this is the key verse in this narrative. It's also the key verse for all the rest of the book of Daniel. See, what Daniel does is this. Now, you've got to remember, he's probably 14 or 15, maybe 16 years old at this point. He's been uprooted from his family and his friends and everything. He's taken to a brand new civilization where this king makes all contemporary world leaders look like a cream puff. Nebuchadnezzar's one tough guy. And he's ordering them all to be reinculturated. And Daniel says, I can go to the king's school. I can learn the king's language. I can do the king's math. I can learn the king's science. I can read the king's literature. I can even take on the name of a Babylonian god. But I cannot eat the king's food, and I cannot drink the king's wine. Now, if you read 10 commentaries on Daniel chapter 1, you'll probably get 20 opinions as to why he drew the line at the food and the wine. Here's the best guess that I think we have. The food and the wine was offered before it was served to the Babylonian god Marduk, as Marduk was the one who was providing this. Well, Daniel knows, hey, I can, I can do all these cultural things in Babylon and get along OK, but I, but I can't give ultimate allegiance to Marduk. I can't do that. That is going to corrupt me spiritually and morally. 
And the word defile here is used twice. It's used 11 times in the Old Testament, and it always means moral or spiritual corruption or defilement. He's saying, I could do all this stuff, but I've got to draw the line there. Now, you've got to understand, this is really dangerous. You don't cross Nebuchadnezzar. And if you read the rest of the book of Daniel, you don't cross him. He has a very good habit of throwing people into fiery furnaces or executing them on the spot because you don't challenge him. He's a complete and total despot. Now, he's actually a really good ruler in some ways, but you don't challenge him. Now, look at what happens here. Verse 9. Now God, the transcendent, awesome God, had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of the Lord my king. <laughs> good, good, you should be. Who assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Ashpenaz is afraid of Nebuchadnezzar, and rightly so. God steps in, and he shows favor and compassion to Daniel. Yeah, Daniel, I get it, get it, get it. You're one of these exiles. You can do all this stuff, but you don't want to do this. But I can't go along with you because, because Nebuchadnezzar will kill me. Now, here's what Daniel could have done with He could have said, yeah, you know what? We, we just got to go along and kill him. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that because he knows God is at work now. Just by the fact that Ashpenaz is showing him compassion and favor. Look at verse 11. So Daniel goes to the next step. Then he says to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but ve vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young man who eat the royal food and test your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and he tested them for 10 days. In other words, what Daniel is doing here, friends, is he's allowing himself to be enculturated to a large measure. But he says, when it comes to ultimate allegiance in life, I cannot be enculturated. I have to draw a line. I have to disenculture it. I have to step away from what Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians want me to do. I can't eat the king's food. And I can't drink the king's wine. I can't do that. I've got to disenculture it at that point. Now, let me take us back to USA Today to make this point relevant for you and me. We're Americans. We live in a representative democracy. That means we get to participate in the political process. I think it's great for Christians to participate in the political process. And however the Lord leads you to do that at the local level or the state level or even the national level, I think that's great. We should, because we have the opportunity, participate in the political process. Many, many, many people around the world don't have that opportunity. We do, so let's do that. Now, here's my point. When we do that, we're enculturated. What we want to remember is this, and this is very difficult, and this has become exceptionally difficult in the last eight years. We have to be really careful here as Christians because politics is really important in life. Politics is not, let me stress this friends, for my sake and your sake and the sake of our Christian formation, politics is not the most important thing in the life of a Christian. Jesus of Nazareth and what he's trying to do in terms of building his kingdom is the most important thing, not politics. Now, you can vote who you want, go for it for who you want, and I will respect that. You can participate in the political spectrum how you want. But when Christians start to diss other Christians because of who they voted for or who they think is best for office, what you've done is you have re-enculturated yourself beyond loyalty to Jesus and that's I saw this at Denver Seminary all over the place in the last five years. People were furious about certain things that happened politically. I show concerns. I have concerns. I think politics is important. I'm a historian. When politics goes south, a lot of people suffer. So I get it, get it, get it. But when you're dissing entire groups of Christians because of the way they voted or who they represented or who they want to be their candidate, you've reinculturated too much. Now, let me go on to money. I like money. You like money. We all need money. Money is a god in this culture. And here's what money tells us. Bow down and worship you. Because if you don't have enough money, you're going to die and suffer. Or suffer and die. Well, I'm 
concerned about money, especially in 10% inflation. Melanie will attest to that. Probably sometimes, in all honesty, if I'm a little bit too concerned. I work on this. This is part of my spiritual formation. Money is a god you do not want to bow down to. Like Luther once said, I love this. He said, God made the hands with fingers so the money would slip right through. <laughs> love Luther. Love him, love him, love him. Sports. I love sports. I love sports. I can't wait till September 8th, which is the night of the NFL opening night. Thursday night, I'll be sitting in front of my TV at home, and we'll probably get pizza or something. I'm going to be, I don't, I don't even know who's playing, and I'm excited. <laughs> but here's the thing. Most of you in here are older now, you don't have to worry about this, but younger parents, they're under huge, huge, huge pressure to enculturate too much by, well, we're not going to go to church today because our kid has soccer or baseball or something else. Uh, not good, not good, not good. Sports is a god. Last but not least, entertainment. Entertainment's a god. Now, here's the thing about entertainment. Entertainment's not bad. I mean, we stream movies, we have videos. There are certain TV shows I like. Okay, that's not wrong, that's not bad. You know, if, if Jesus were around today, he'd probably engage in streaming a little bit. He'd probably go to the theater, he might go to the opera, who knows, okay? He wouldn't be afraid to engage those parts of our culture. But any part of the entertainment industry that corrupts us spiritually or causes us to be defiled, we should run from like crazy. Now, you all remember video stores. They used to exist back a number of years ago. I'll never forget this. This was about 20 years ago. Maybe it wasn't even that long, because I think they were still around when we got married. I was down at Hollywood Video, which is by our house. It's no longer there, obviously. But I was looking for a movie, and there was this dad in there with this little girl. She must have been about six or seven. And I'll never forget, I just walked right past them, and this little girl said to her dad, Daddy, these movies all look so scary. And I thought, yeah, some of them are really bad. And I thought, anything that looks spiritually or morally scary or bad, we should disenculture it. I should, and you should. Now, let me go back to the text here, if I can find my sheet. Thank you. Let's see what happens here to Daniel and his friends. Verse 15. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So look what the guard does. He knows what's good for them and what's good for him. He's going to get chips with Ashkenaz for this. So the guard took away their choice food and wine, and they were to drink and gave uh, the choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Now, look at verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Verses 18 and following. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into service, this is three years, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found, no, notice this, but listen, 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 this is really important. He found none of them equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Mishael and Azariah, so they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Let me make three comments. They choose to disenculturate over the king's food and wine. They can do everything else, but they can't do that. So they choose to disenculturate on that. God comes to their rescue. God is there with them because he's the transcendent, awesome, loving God. So they choose to disenculturate in order to stay pure to him. Number two, I don't want us to miss this. It costs them to do that. They went on a radical vegetarian diet for three years. Now, I happen to like Chinese and Japanese food. I don't want to eat it three times a day every day. Friends, for you and me to be true, godly, spiritual Christians in America in 2022, it's going to cost us. We need to recognize this. It's going to make, it means we need to make some sacrifices. Now, that might look different for you than it does for me, but we're going to need to make sacrifices. We need to do that for our Christian formation. And number three, God once again comes to them, and he makes them into these incredibly gifted people because, and here's the deal, God wants people in Babylon to know 
here's what I look like. Here's what a royal servant who's totally sold out to me in Babylon looks like. He looks like Daniel, and he looks like Hananiah, and he looks like Mishael, and he looks like Azariah. God wants his presence to be seen in the court at Babylon because God loves Babylonians too, and he wants Babylonians to come to know him. And see, that's what God thinks about all these people out here in greater Lakewood and greater Denver. He wants them to see. Here's what the Christians, the bridge of their creek look like. They look like people who love him, who love others, who, yeah, they're Americans. They drive cars, they go to sports games, they listen to music, they watch videos, but they're pure and they're holy because they're completely and totally dedicated to Jesus of Nazareth. See, here's the thing in narrative literature. It's easy to diss verses like verse 21, the last verse of this narrative. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Oh, the author put that in there very, very intentionally because he wants you and me to know this. King Cyrus was a Persian king 65 years down the road. By then, Nebuchadnezzar's gone. The Babylonian Empire's gone. The Persians have taken over. Daniel, in his 80s, is doing just fine. He's doing just fine. And God will use him with the Persians just like he used him with the Babylonians. And that's what God wants for you. He wants for me. He wants us in our 80s and 90s and beyond to be a doing just fine serving him in the midst of very rapidly changing culture. I've gone a little bit over. Thank you for your patience. Let me pray for us. Father, thanks for my friends here. Thanks for your word. By your spirit, Lord, help us to be totally dedicated to Jesus. Thanks so much for your time, for letting me share with you. Well, it's, it's where you're engaging the culture, but you realize there's a lot of tension there because the culture's falling, and you're falling. And you want to engage it, and you want to minister to it, but you recognize there's, 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 there's always tension there. It's never going to be completely what you want it to be. And the guy that he, he picks, the two main people he picks for that from the Apostle Paul and Mark Luke, and he said, Paul was always engaged in Roman civilization everywhere he went. And he was always preaching the gospel and setting up his new churches in order to redeem it. But he recognized that until Jesus returns, it's never going to be what we want to do. We need to do whatever we can. Yeah, it was on a tightrope because culture is so powerful. And so my own opinion is this. I mean, the transformative piece has happened. That has happened. But what we fail to realize is it usually takes decades, if not centuries, for a culture to be transformed. It happens. It's happened before, but it takes a very long time. So, like I said, all my students, well, I'm going to be a, you know, Christ is transforming the culture person. I'm going, great, you go do that. But what they realize about the American community, which is what I understand, is this is pretty hard. This takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time.
you're not going to be so, tempted to be Paul's house. That, that has no temptation for you, no pressure on you whatsoever. But you know this and you don't. There are places inside of you that, for whatever reason, whatever way, you might say, you know what, do I, do I compromise here? Am I compromising? Because like you, you said, David, it's, it's completely different than North American civilization, completely. But there are places in that culture where Thai Christians and those who are ministering to Thai Christians and seeking to win Thai people to Christ, there are places of tension. Yes. The missionary's job, whether you're in North America, Thailand, Argentina, China, Europe, it doesn't matter. The missionary's job is to figure out what's proper contextualization and where do I need to draw the lines right? We can't. But this, this text is directly relevant to you because they're leaving a monotheistic culture, which they had compromised on and became functionally polytheistic, like worshiping the gods of Cain and Moloch and all that. This is why God put them into exile. You know, and they're, now they're carried off to a genuinely polytheistic society. I mean, Babylon was so polytheistic. Gods and goddesses everywhere. And Marduk was probably the preeminent one. But they get into that and all of a sudden they realize, I mean, I love the book of Daniel. I love that chapter. But it's, it's a challenging and convicting chapter. Because he rolls the dice. Does he, God comes to his rescue, but does, if he has to step out of faith, I'm going to do the right thing and trust that God will, God will rescue. Which God does. God comes to the rescue. You know, gives him favor and compassion. And then, you know, they... they Shine, but they sacrifice. Like I said, can you imagine a vegetarian diet with water and vegetables for three years? That's all they can eat. Who's the sacrifice? Because you know the king's food wine. I'm not a foodie, but not any more testimonies. I like to eat, eat good food. That would have been a temptation. I was like, I don't want to eat that for three years. But they did, because they said that's the price we're going to get. Right. Parts. And one of the struggles with time then is sexuality. Yes. And the sexual sin. And so, you know, looking at the, the spiritual warfare that goes oh. on. And so for us, what do we enculturate, what do we disenculturate about? The issue of spirituality is huge, especially with homosexuality and with new young missionaries coming to the field who have been over enculturated in American sexuality kinds of things. And then how do you pull that? Love, those, those are our people that we're called to love, our missionaries, to strengthen them with their service. It's so messy. And I'm so glad you're there and that you see that clearly, <laughs> because yeah. it's interesting what you just said. Well, we have missionaries coming from America. They've been so enculturated in American culture. Now, let me just say it straight. They can't see the truth of what the Bible is teaching. That this is right. This is wrong. There's really not much gray in between. But in America, we're all, we always want to live here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear people say this all the time. Well, oh, this is complicated. No, yeah, you're right. It is complicated. And God says, yeah, I know it's complicated. Here's how you're supposed to do this. And he tells me that. Scott, yeah, OK, I get it, get it, get it with you. But it's, Scott, <laughs> this is what you're supposed to do. Live this way. Make these decisions. Make these choices. Don't go here. That's not good for you. And it enculturates you too much. How you brought it up in this way using the USA yes. name. Because yes. these are the, uh, the, the gods of they America. Are the gods of America. America. And we, we swim in it. We swim yes, all with time. everybody. And, and I like the, the passage you chose in Daniel. What is the one thing in all these sections of culture that God is telling me to go? I, I will not eat this food. What is, what is that? What is that? And yet, and yet, in all the other areas, you know, I, I can be fully engaged. Yeah, I may disagree with your political views. I may disagree with your ideas about money, but I fully love you as Jesus Christ loves. And it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost. It comes at a cost. Yeah, you're facing costs now. Yes. And, it, and God will take care of us, and we will be in our 80s soon. So. Amen. Preach. That's great. It comes at a cost. It comes at a cost today that is hard. Yeah. 
yeah, I'm not a prophet. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But, but I do know that what we call biblical Christianity is now further and further on the margins. It's on the margins. Okay. Well, We're almost a cult. Well, and here, here's what's encouraging to me. There, there was a book that was published by a great New Testament scholar about six years ago called Destroyer of the Gods. His name was Larry Larry has since passed a But it's basically was his overview of the early churches in Gaia from the Roman civilization. And he has a chapter where he talks about how basically the Romans viewed the early Christians as a religious cult that was undermining the Roman civilization. And they viewed them as weird and strange because they wouldn't engage in many, all, but many practices of Roman civilization. And so Christians were viewed as weird and strange and unusual, and they got, you know, bad rap. And I'm thinking, is that one of the reasons we're afraid to disenculturate us because we're afraid people will think we're weird? We don't like being weird. We don't like being marginalized. We don't like being on the fringes. We don't like people looking at us and pointing to us and saying, we're just bizarre. But I'm thinking, that's how the early church was. It's for part makes clear, but over time, over time, you know, stress this, the decades and the centuries, they eventually infiltrated and transformed the empire. All for the good, I like. So let us embrace weirdness with God. Amen. 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 Somebody kind of wanted to play somebody right in Daniel's story that he, he, he got a new name. Yeah. Right that culture. yeah. Well, well the, the people in Pompeii yeah. didn't know me by oh, my yeah. name that I got in America. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They, they called me Nympic, which is uh, yeah. it was an honorary yeah. title. Uh, it was kind of second in command in their five municipalities, each municipality. Premier Chief. That was the second blow that the Premier Chief had. It was an honor and title. It was a Premier Chief. Uh, premier chief. And everybody in the island called me by that name. They didn't call me by that name. <laughs> and, and the other one after that, I went to the post office and told one of the islands and asked for Roy Jones. Nobody knew him. <laughs> but they knew you by your native. If, if, you, if you said the midwife uh, or uh, United States, the yes. I mean, my guy, they know, oh yeah, we know who that is. And they knew where I lived. But uh, I happened to go to the post office and I heard him asking for me. And I said, uh, uh, are you asking for the Warren Jones? You know, that you have connected with the church in Walmart. And he says, yeah. He said, I really began to I was thinking you lied to the church. And they were just saying, dude, because nobody knew who you were. He says, nobody on the island is getting me. He says, they do know. He says, if they don't call me Will Jones, they call me not me. And that's what everybody turned out. So I, I was given a new name. So. Yeah, see, I would say that's really healthy contextualization. The fact that they gave you a new name and you by it. Yeah, I learned their culture and language, and uh, one of the non marquees gave me the title as, as a thank you for learning their culture. Yes. Yes. We lived with the people. We didn't live with them. There you go. Yeah. But yeah, that was. I enjoyed your presentation. Well, thanks. It's great. it's great to be here.